Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, namaste and a very good morning, uh, friends. Thank you all for joining uh, on our virtual speaker series. Uh, friends, promoting good health has been a, a key priority area for CIF and in particular, the holistic preventative health. As you all know, we have been running a biweekly speaker series on Ayurveda. And today, our focus is on one of the most challenging health issues facing the world, depression. And our special speaker uh, this morning is one of our own very bright young scientist, Dr. Venkat Bhatt. Uh, welcome, Dr. Bhatt. Thank uh, you, Satish. Thank you. Uh, uh, friends, according to World Health Organization, over 280 million people are currently under some sort of depressive order. A large number of them are women. And what is even more tragic is that almost 700,000, a majority of them young people, die by suicide every year. And following the key reason is the depressive episodes. And to throw light on one of the most promising scientific, uh, scientific research being done currently, we have with us the young and distinguished uh, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, Dr. Bhatt is a assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at University of Toronto. He is a staff psychiatrist based at St. Michael Hospital. At St. Michael, he's the director of interventional neuropsychiatry program, which offers novel pharmacological neurostimulation and digital therapeutic intervention for mood and other disorders. In short, Dr. Bhatt leads a research that is absolutely at the cutting edge in finding the solution to the challenge of depression. And friends, we at CIF are fully committed to supporting alternative uh, treatment, many therapies like Ayurveda and yoga in treating mental illness and the relevance of these systems that look at body and mind as one of the one to achieve positive outcomes on both fronts have been widely acknowledged by many researchers. Healthy eating, physical activity, yoga, meditation, all have been found to be beneficial to the human mind and body. And we sincerely looking forward to a future where the most promising discoveries from the brilliant scientists of today, like Dr. Bhatt, meet with the, some of the enduring wisdom from the ancient period to come up with ideal treatment options for the millions suffering from depression. And uh, today's special session is very special. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Venkat Bhatt, special welcome. And thank you so very much for joining to give us the knowledge and wisdom on this very key pressing issue. Uh, Dr. Bhatt, over to you. Thank you, Sudesh. Uh, thank you to the CIF and to you for the invitation. It is my pleasure to present today. I'm just going to screen share here. Are you able to see my slide set? Yes, absolutely. All right. So um, that's my disclosures before we get started. Um, just the customary disclosure slide. Now, moving on, uh, and I just want to let people know that this will be a busy set of slides. Um, I'm not going to go through everything in detail, but I know that the talk will be made available, so you can always go through it online and people can reach out to me as well or my team if there are specific questions. So um, there'll be quite a bit of territory to cover today. Um, my objective here for you as you go through these, uh, the, the presentation is to provide you an awareness of what is depression, what are the um, common uh, in issues to be considered in the diagnosis, uh, of depression. Secondly, it's about what are the current evidence-based treatments for depression? And then I'll give you a peek, uh, an introduction to the emerging treatment modalities. Our 
research program is focused on developing new treatments where current evidence-based treatments don't work. So those are the three objectives. I'll go through things, objective number one, uh, and then number two, and then number three. All right, so let me start off by speaking about mood fluctuations. Um, so to give people context, this is an overview of um, uh, mood changes, which could be over a day, minute by minute, over multiple days. Um, what's important to keep know is that all of us have highs and lows, which last for different periods in response to normal life challenges. What makes it a, a disorder is how persistent, pervasive it is, and how disabling it is represented by a change in people's usual level of functioning. So it has to be persistent, it has to be pervasive, and it has to lead to functional disabilities and uh, uh, significant change in terms of previous functioning. Um, so we have two categories here. Uh, I want to make things clear uh, before we get, get into discussing specifics about depression. So we have two broad categories, unipolar depression and bipolar depression, um, or bipolar disorder and unipolar disorder. So what differentiates the two is that with bipolar disorder, people have the sustained highs. Uh, so when I say sustained, it is for multiple days, day after day, continuously. Uh, and when I say lows, uh, you know, I also mean the symptoms of depression, which is not only about low mood, but multiple other symptoms continuously for two weeks or longer. Um, so this is a subclassification of uh, bipolar disorders and depressive disorders. Um, so bipolar disorder includes bipolar one, based on whether people have mania, bipolar two, based on whether they have hypomania, and then people have alternating uh, symptoms of depression and of uh, low mood as well as uh, hypomania or mania. So that's on the bipolar side. Um, and then there's the unipolar depression, which includes major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder. Um, and uh, there are also secondary uh, substance induced or medication induced or mood disorder due to a medical condition. Uh, it's important to keep this distinction in mind. Um, so in this talk, uh, I will really be speaking about unipolar depression. Um, so the burden of unipolar depression is huge, uh, as uh, Satish alluded to at the beginning of the talk. Um, I will not be speaking about bipolar disorder or depression occurring in the context of bipolar disorder. The management is a bit different, but it's also out of scope for the, uh, the discussion today. So, Moving ahead, when I say depression, I will mean unipolar depression. So all the treatments we talk about today are for unipolar depression. All right, so what are the specifiers and the subtypes of depression? Um, so the, the, uh, you know, this is important to keep in mind because depression is very heterogeneous. It, it presents with a different combination of symptoms. Um, so this is a slide which um, I'm not going to go through in detail, but I'll just mention uh, you know, a couple of things which, which are key here. So one is remission, which means people have no symptoms at all. So our treatment in objective is always to achieve remission. So people need to have, people need to return back to their baseline. Um, and then there's the onset. Is it early? Is it late? Um, or is it peripartum? Um, so the, the childbirth and leading up to childbirth and after childbirth, that is a period which has a heightened risk for depression among women. So there's special attention to that, that um, phase of uh, um, life. Then there's the severity. Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? So some treatments are more... Um, suitable for mild, some are more for moderate, and some are for severe. And then there's illness pattern. Is this a first episode? Is it a recurring episode? Is it seasonal? Seasonal affective disorder um, is managed differently as compared to uh, 
single episode of unipolar depression. And then there are the other subtypes. Does the person present with anxiety? Does the person also have symptoms of hypomania? Is it atypical? So there are a number of subtypes there. All right, now moving on, what is depression? Um, so uh, it's an illness uh, which negatively affects the brain and the body. Um, um, so the, it is well known that the effects of depression um, are systemic. It's um, predominantly mediated by the brain, but uh, there's an interaction with stress and how the body responds to stress. And all the organ systems are affected with uh, chronic depression. Uh, it is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Um, the burden of disability exceeds cardiovascular disease, um, stroke, cancer. It is worldwide the leading cause of disability. Um, now, in terms of the kinds of questions your healthcare provider will ask in order to diagnose depression, which I'll get into in the next couple of slides, they'll want to know how long you've had the symptoms and how the symptoms have affected your life and your relationships. I mentioned before that there has to be a change in terms of functioning, and often that change is in terms of uh, people's professional and per personal responsibilities, obligations, and relationships. Um, early treatment, early detection can significantly reduce this burden. Well, um, part of the talk today is about current evidence-based treatments, and I'll go to uh, go through it there. And then half of the depressive episodes are generally shot and resolved within three months. So this is this is uh, important to keep in mind. Now, why learn about depression? I think I've mentioned the burden of illness, but it's also important to keep in mind that depression does not discriminate. Men and women are affected. Women are affected even more than men, but, uh, particularly during the adult life period. Uh, it, um, across ethnicities, rich and poor, all are susceptible. So learning about depression can help decrease the stigma and also obtain uh, you know, an understanding of mental illness. Um, I remember someone who said there are only two categories of individuals or families, those who have mental illness and those who do not have mental illness yet. So it is pervasive and it is important to uh, understand the disorder so that the symptoms are recognized in this early treatment to reduce disease burden. All right, now moving on, how is depression diagnosed? So um, the presentation today, I will stick with the Canadian depression guidelines. Um, and we are currently working to develop the 2023-24 guidelines. This is the previous guidelines. I'm part of the Canadian committee to develop the guidelines. So I will be presenting the depression guidelines from the uh, previously published version. It's all available online, but I will be giving the significant aspects that you need to know today. So how is depression diagnosed? Um, healthcare providers in Canada use different tools. So the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is published by the American Psychiatric Association, that is one um, that gives us the symptom checklist, the duration criteria, which I will mention in a moment. I already alluded to that at the beginning about having persistent, pervasive symptoms lasting a certain pe time period and having an impact in terms of functioning. The other classification is the international classification of diseases published by the World Health Organization. There's a lot of synchronization between the two, uh, and the two are mostly similar. There are a few differences, but they're mostly similar. Um, so what are the symptoms of depression? I have uh, mentioned about low mood before. As you can see, low mood is one of the symptoms. You People need to have multiple other symptoms. It is usually five out of these symptoms, um, along with having low mood and lack of interest for at least two weeks. Um, and it has to be persistent and pervasive. 
sadness that has lasted two weeks or more, a lack of interest, what we call anhedonia. Um, it is usually things which are people, things which people were interested in before, where they lose interest. Significant change in weight or change in appetite. It could go up or or it could go down. It could be either way. Changes in sleep. Again, it could be an increase or decrease in sleep. Changes in movement or speech. Um, people mention lack of energy, feeling tired all day, a sense of unworthiness, guilt, um, difficulty concentrating. The guilt is often, you know, I am bad, I have no future, there's no future for the world, that kind of a negative uh, uh, thinking. This difficulty concentrating, the concentration challenges are critical um, as they lead to the significant burden of illness, which I mentioned before. And then there's the thoughts of death or suicide. Depression is the leading cause of, or uh, uh, it is you know, almost 60 to 80% of people who have death by suicide report having depression. So how common is depression? About 10% of Canadians who are 15 or, or older have experienced depression at some time in their lives. Um, I mentioned before that women are more likely than men to be diagnosed and young are also more likely than older to have had uh, to have depression. So this is a busy slide, but just gives you a quick overview of uh, how common depression is. This is dated, it's 2012, uh, with the impact of the pandemic and the other aspects, the, the um, uh, and the in ongoing changes that the prevalence is, is um, different, it has gone up. Uh, I'm not going through the, those details, but this is to give you a sense of people when they say that in the last 12 months I've had depression, this is from 2012, but roughly 4% said that they had depression, roughly 63% sought treatment, one third were taking an antidepressant, 25% had, uh, uh, anxiety along with symptoms of depression. Depression and anxiety are often two sides of the same coin. They go together. Um, a number of them had suicide attempts, as you can see. And then there's also um, a higher prevalence of substance use, alcohol, and other disorders among people who have depression. Um, if you look at this in a different way as to how long people had depression when they said they had depression during the last year, roughly 30%, uh, as you can see, had it right through the year. And then, um, uh, you know, another 20% uh, had for less than six weeks, another 20 for almost 12 weeks, and another 30% for 13 to 20 weeks. Now, the disease burden of depression, I've mentioned this before, it is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Um, significant impact on interpersonal relationships, social and family relationships, and at work. Um, it is the leading cause for presenteeism and absenteeism, days lost from work, or people are at work, but there's lost productivity. So um, you can see that often people have a first episode or a second episode of depression, and even if they return to work, they're not able to function um, at the levels that they were used to before, and this is that cognitive, that difficulty to focus, that difficulty to concentrate uh, in aspect. Uh, it is well known that depression comorbid with other medical conditions, whether it is cancer, heart disease, any other medical condition leads to adverse outcome for both. So we currently try to target both simultaneously. And there are some studies which suggest to give an example that if people have depression and heart disease, Treating depression is as important for the heart disease outcomes as it is uh, with treating the heart disease itself. So uh, it is the same case for diabetes, very higher comorbidity with uh, depression. It is important to, to treat both to have better outcomes for both. It's just as important to treat the medical side as well to have better outcomes with depression. And as we have mentioned before, it is the leading cause for death by suicide. So what are some of the risk factors for depression? Um, so a history of depression, um, you know, whether it's personal or whether it's a family history of depression um, leads to 
or uh, the risk that is a known risk factor, psychosocial adversity, particularly I, uh, early childhood adversity. There's a lot of literature on that as increasing people's risk for depression, having a really negative impact in terms of the stress response. Um, and then all medical conditions I mentioned earlier, diabetes, heart disease, neurological conditions are associated with a higher risk for depression. Um, and times of hormonal challenge. Uh, so this could be the menopausal years for women or the childbirth years uh, 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 in a peripartum period or the childbirth period associated with significant hormonal changes. Some other symptom factors, pain um, and chronic pain is highly comorbid with depression. Roughly two thirds of people with chronic pain also report depression and often treatments for one work for the other and we look for uh, combined combination treatments. All right, so what are some of the risk factors for suicide or death by suicide or suicide attempts during depression? So we look at them as non-modifiable and modifiable. Um, so non-modifiable, older men, a previous history of suicide attempt, um, history of self-injurious behavior, um, family history of suicide, being a sexual minority, history of legal problems. These are some non-modifiable risk factors. And then we have modifiable risk factors like treating the symptoms of depression, um, the hopelessness or the anxiety, impulsivity, and, and then comorbid conditions, particularly substance use disorder, uh, chronic uh, painful medical conditions. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, I'll have a number of slides like this and for people who are interested, you can go through them in greater detail uh, as the uh, talk will be available uh, um, after. So um, when we look at treating depression, and uh, I will, um, you know, after the next few slides, move into the treatment aspects once you have a sense of what is depression and what are the treatments. So we have two phases, the acute phase and a maintenance phase. So when I say the acute phase, this is the first eight to 12 weeks roughly. And the objective here for the treating clinician is remission of symptoms. When I said remission, people go back to what they were before the onset of depression and we want to restore functioning. So the objectives here are uh, to select evidence-based treatments and to monitor progress, which I'll go over uh, in a couple of slides. And then we move to the maintenance phase. Once people get better, we move to the maintenance phase. So the acute phase is how do we get people well? That is the key question here. And then the maintenance phase is when people are better or when people are well, how do we keep them well? And uh, the, the ways to do that and the treatments which are um, considered vary based on whether it's the acute or the maintenance phase. Um, so, a few questions here which people could have. Um, will you always have depression if you've had an episode? Depression can be a relapsing and remitting condition. Um, um, the definition, uh, we, when I say remission, it is people going back to their baseline without symptoms and often at least for two months. Um, symptoms may not fully go away with time. So that is uh, partial um, remission or response, or the symptoms may change over time. Um, roughly a quarter of people experience depressive symptoms for at least two years, um, and one third actually um, re-experience the symptoms of depression within three years. So next, the question is, what are the risk factors for chronicity and for recurrence? So earlier age of onset, um, greater number of previous episodes. How severe is the initial episode? Uh, is it associated with suicidal ideation uh, with a larger number of symptoms? How is it impacting the sleep-wake cycle? Um, uh, family history is a significant factor for recurrence or chronicity um, and also stressful life events. So this is a quick summary you know, for the question on what, what is the risk for people to have repeated episodes and to have chronicity. 
Okay, so some of the questions here, what's the role of technology to treat depression? Um, so there are a number of electronic mental health tools available, smartphone, uh, mobile applications, online programs. Um, you know, it, it, it can help you as well as your healthcare provider to assess, to monitor, uh, and to manage the symptoms. So this is, um, um, you know, an outdated slide, but this is from our previous guidelines. We, we are working as we speak on coming up with newer Canadian guidelines, but this is an overview of the kinds of e-mental health resources. So it could be information, it could be screening where people download an app to be able to monitor the, all of the symptoms I mentioned before, sleep, activity, um, uh, mood, concentration, and it helps people to do self-management. And then there are also sources for social support. Moving on, so I'm, I've now completed section one, which is giving you an introduction to depression, disease burden, and the common comorbidities and an approach to treatment. So the next section will be about the current evidence-based treatments for adult depression. I'm mentioning this because uh, depression is across the lifespan. Uh, when I say adult, I mean between ages 18 to 65. I'm not going to be speaking today about childhood and adolescent depression or de managing depression on the geriatric side, which is uh, you know, 65 and plus. Um, so in all of the things which I'll be mentioning today are specific to adult depression between ages 18 to 65. So here are the major treatment modalities. So we have pharmacology, psychotherapy, neurostimulation, and complementary and alternative treatments. So I'll go through a series of questions here quickly. And these are common questions which uh, patients who I see ask me. Um, so who should be treated with pharmacotherapy? So people with um, moderate and severe symptoms of depression, um, pharmacotherapy, has uh, is first line. Um, how do antidepressants compare? Um, so a lot of, uh, there are uh, several antidepressants out there, particularly acting through the monominergic system. Um, they're mostly similar, although there are a few uh, based upon comparative network meta-analysis to have shown slightly better efficacy, but often antidepressant choice comes down to tolerability. Um, which we know the side effects and it's, it's a discussion with the patient to see which side effects the person might be able to bear in the shorter term or in the longer term. Um, so are antidepressants associated with suicidality? Um, this is more a concern among the teenage population. Um, it is um, um, with people who have moderate or severe depression, there's a reduction in suicidality. And even if people have increase in uh, suicidal ideation, it is during the first few days. So that's why clinicians usually monitor patients who are started on the new antidepressant the first few days, the first one or two weeks. Um, uh, you know, because people can have side effects, they're not able to tolerate it. If they already have symptoms of suicidality, it can increase those anxiety symptoms, or people can have, be, can get cognitively better, whereas they're uh, in suicidal ideation may take some more time to actually improve. Um, how do I know if my antidepressant is working? So it's important to keep in mind that uh, people need to give four to six weeks to actually know whether the antidepressant is working. Um, we emphasize uh, adequate medication trials, which includes at the appropriate dose for the appropriate duration. So it's usually four to six weeks. What if my antidepressant is not working? And what if I have chronic depression? So these questions, I'll go through a flow chart in a moment, not through all the details. As I said, the information will be available, but it will answer these questions. So here's some of the pros and the cons, um, which I've uh, you know, alluded to earlier. Antidepressant medications are often the first and the best treatment for severe depression, um, but different medications may need to be tried. Um, combining antidepressants with psychotherapy is often the best treatment in severe depression. Um, you know, one of the cons is that there are possible side effects with antidepressants. Each of them has 
different side effects which need to be discussed. Uh, it, it, antidepressants can improve mood and all of the other symptoms, but they can have some side effects and weight gain and sexual side effects are uh, the longer term side effects that some of the antidepressants can have. Again, a discussion between the clinician and the patient. Um, and uh, uh, in, suicidal thoughts may temporarily increase as I have in, alluded to before, although there is a reduction after. Moving on, so this is uh, uh, you know a simplified version of how we select an antidepressant. So we consider the clinical factors in selecting an antidepressant. We see whether the person is on other medications. We look at drug-drug interactions if the person is on other medications. And then there's an important discussion about the side effects. As I mentioned before, the antidepressants really differ in terms of their side effects. And then we select and initiate a first line antidepressant. So what happens after? So I mentioned that to the question, is my antidepressant working? We have to wait for four to six weeks to know whether the medication has worked or not. Um, and we make a decision at that point whether to continue the treatment or do we actually switch or do we add other medications? Um, so it, I just want to walk you through two or three things here because it answers some of the common questions which people ask. So if there's early improvement, people are more likely to have improvement. So if, two, if people have improvement within two weeks, they're more likely to have improvement at four to six weeks. Um, and then we consider a switch if people don't have improvement or we consider adding medications from a different class. Now, if the person has had uh, remission, which is people go back to what they were before, as I've mentioned before, the, there's the acute phase and then there's the maintenance phase. So how to get people well, once they're well, how to keep them well. So we look at the risk factors for recurrence and the maintenance phase is for about six to nine months once they've had the improvement. If they have the risk factors, I've gone over some of them before, the maintenance is much longer, it's for two years or longer. So I just want to mention one or two new things here, um, but uh, you know, uh, um, I'll transition over to the program which I lead, which is focused on developing new treatments. But this is an example um, of an intranasal uh, you know, treatment, S-ketamine, uh, which was approved in 2019 by FDA and later by Health Canada. So this, at this point, is not OHIP covered. There are some um, uh, private insurances which actually cover. It has to be administered with a current oral antidepressant. Um, and it has an induction phase and a maintenance phase. It's administered twice per week. And uh, just to make things uh, more clear, I've shown a picture of a person who is actually uh, in, uh, inhaling it with the internasal spray device. Um, as things stand, it um, has to be in a monitored setting. So people have to come into uh, a clinical setting, which is part of um, um, a certified healthcare setting or pharmacy with the physician, be there for two hours and then leave. Um, so this is a newer treatment for uh, treatment resistant depression. Moving on, I'll be speaking about psychotherapy next. So when and for which individuals, um, impact of comorbidities. Again, these are some of the common questions which people ask and you know I often have to discuss. So what's the impact of gender and age? How do you choose a psychotherapy? Um, how many sessions are required? Individual versus group. How effective is virtual psychotherapy? Should I combine medications with psychotherapy? Um, so this is a busy slide, but I just want to, uh, you know, this is from our guidelines, but I wanted to focus on three things here. Um, there are many psychotherapies, you know, available, uh, cognitive behavioral, interpersonal behavioral, mindfulness-based uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, problem solving, so the list goes on. So the best evidence currently is for cognitive behavioral therapy, as you can see, first line, interpersonal therapy and behavioral activation. So what is cognitive behavioral therapy? So cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on recognizing negative or pessimistic thoughts that can lead to depression. Um, and 
the focus here is on thought records and people looking at their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and actually keeping the, the log and reviewing that with their psychologist on a weekly basis. It is time limited. Uh, these treatments, they, they don't go on beyond a certain time period. And these are evidence-based treatments. Second is interpersonal therapy. It, it helps you learn how depression can be caused or made worse. Um, and it is uh, uh, recommended, especially in combination with antidepressant medications. And then there's behavioral activation. So some pros and cons, uh, minimal unwanted side effects. Um, psychotherapy takes longer. Um, in psychotherapy for, uh, is comparable in terms of efficacy to uh, pharmacotherapy, but it takes longer. So people who have severe depression, moderate to severe depression, often we suggest medications because they may not be able to go through psychotherapy, whereas for mild depression, uh, you know, psychotherapy is, is equivalent uh, to, to pharmacotherapy. The different modes of delivery have evidence. Um, one thing to keep in mind that psychotherapy could be costly as uh, you know, there's limited provincial coverage for psychotherapy. Moving on, I'll be speaking about the third modality. So I mentioned pharmacology, I've mentioned psychotherapy. The third modality is neurostimulation. So this is a busy slide, but it gives you an overview of the modalities that are out there. Um, so part of my work at UHN, University Health Network, where I'm also based, is uh, the deep brain stimulation program. So I'm the psychiatrist for the deep brain stimulation program there. Um, so it, what you see here is on the x-axis you see by invasiveness and on the y-axis you see uh, by how focal is the treatment. So something like electroconvulsive therapy involves the entire brain in terms of causing a generalized seizure, whereas something like uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, you know, involves a very specific region of the brain. So this is the current evidence. Um, it is well established now that neurostimulation is on par. It is just as good as pharmacotherapy and uh, psychotherapy. Um, it is a third line established modality now for managing depression. Um, in a stepped care approach, it's often offered for people who have failed one antidepressant because of access and other, other uh, you know, issues. So TMS is first line, transcranial magnetic stimulation. ECT, one of the oldest uh, treatments out there, it predates pharmacology. Um, it is the gold standard when nothing has worked. Uh, it, is, it, has, uh, it has the best efficacy for treatment resistant depression, particularly psychotic depression. Um, on the other hand, it's also associated with side effects. So that's part of the reason why it is more a last resort. So this is an overview of uh, you know, electrical stimulation, transclinial electrical stimulation versus magnetic stimulation. So ultimately the brain is an electrochemical organ. Um, so you, know, you can try to stimulate the brain with electricity or you can try to uh, use pharmacotherapy or you can use other modalities like psychotherapy, but they're acting through um, specific changes within uh, the, the neural circuitry. So uh, with transcranial electrical uh, 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 you know, stimulation, which is uh, in ECT, we're actually sending an electrical current between two electrodes and it leads to a seizure, a generalized seizure. Whereas with TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, we are targeting a very focal region of the brain and we're not inducing seizures. People are wide awake, people come in, uh, it, it is a couple of minutes treatment, they get back to work. So this is what a TMS device looks like, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, the ECT device looks like what you see here, where it says electrical stimulation. Uh, the magnetic stimulation device looks like this, and this is the setting where it is given. Here you see a few approved devices for depression. Um, so people sit in the chair when they come in, as you can see here, and the treatment is for a couple of minutes. And the treatments are given day, day after day for four to six weeks. That's the FDA approved TMS. Um, so a 
few questions here. Uh, ECT is widely available. TMS is available at a few places. Um, uh, TMS is not as effective as ECT is, but TMS doesn't have the side effects of ECT. Uh, when I say the side effect, I mean the cognitive side effect. ECT has become a lot safer than in the past, but there's still some cognitive side effects, which TMS does not have. Um, and then I've also mentioned about some of the other modalities, deep brain stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation. This is really the last resort after you know, even TMS, uh, 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 ECT and all other treatments have failed. And the evidence there is more in the longer term as compared to in the shorter term. Now, moving on, I've covered pharmacotherapy, I've come, covered psychotherapy, I've also covered neurostimulation. This is the last treatment modality, which is complementary and alternative medicine treatments. It's important to keep in mind that the quality of research here, um, you know, that it is often difficult for us developing guidelines to place complementary and alternative medication treatments um, um, because we do not have rigorous, well done trials. We do have a few, and based on them, we come up with the uh, uh, recommendations. So um, we have the physical and meditative treatments, and then natural health products. So this is the current uh, you know, evidence. This is being updated. This is a, a few years old, but um, with exercise for mild to moderate depression, it is first line. Um, we recommend it for people who may not want uh, you know, psychotherapy may not be able to access psychotherapy or may not want medications as a first line for mild to moderate depression. And as an adjunctive add-on with medication psychotherapy or neurostimulation um, for moderate to severe light therapy, uh, for seasonal winter uh, uh, in depression, it's first line. Um, with the previous guidelines, yoga uh, has evidence as an adjunctive treatment for mild to moderate depression, and it is similar with acupuncture as well. Now with, um, you know, other orally, uh, uh, you know, taken or other complementary treatments, there's some evidence for St. John's wort, which um, for, again, for mild to moderate depression, not for severe depression. Um, the, the, uh, in, this information will be available. So if, if people want to go through, they could go through it after. All right, so now I'm going to move on in the next eight or uh, minutes or so, speaking about treatment resistant depression and the program which I lead at St. Michael's, the Intervention Neuropsychiatry Program, which we developed to actually, uh, to, to um, um, develop new treatments for treatment resistant mental health conditions. Depression is the core area, but we also work on other disorders, but today's topic is about depression, so I'll be focusing on depression. So why do we need new treatments? With all the things I showed you before, there's still one third of people who do not improve. Um, we have quite a few treatments. Uh, there's often a challenge with people with stigma and people not being diagnosed or people being diagnosed but not taking medications or having concerns about being on medications. Even with all of that, there's still uh, one third of people roughly who do not respond. And you see here before a timeline of different treatments. So this is the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, the tricyclics. So we did not have any new treatments developed for depression until ketamine came along as a, um, a new treatment. Ketamine has been used as an anesthetic for a long period of time, but uh, repurposing ketamine opened a new pipeline for drug discovery in depression. Um, so this is our program. We have three pillars. It's You will see that there are some similarities to what I've mentioned before. So we have a clinical ketamine program. Um, we also do quite a bit of research there. Um, we have um, a few emerging uh, in treatments which we're looking at, nitrous oxide, which is another anesthetic agent, uh, you know, agent psychedelics, psilocybin. Um, it's important to keep in mind that this is really research at this point, um, whether it's uh, you know, psychedelics or nitrous oxide. With neurostimulation, we have a clinical TMS and ECT program. 
our research focuses on take home modalities of neurostimulation. We're also looking at neuromodalities of TMS, but we also want people, um, as I mentioned before, for maintenance treatments, when people get well, how to keep them well, to have treatments which they can actually use at home. And a significant amount of our work is in the third pillar, which is the digital pillar, where we do measurement-based care, but we also have a focus in terms of digital therapeutics. I'll give some information in the next few minutes on this. So we're really about combination treatments. So, uh, you know, it, the patient is at the center and all the treatments are around the patient. Uh, it's not, we do not want a siloed approach where patients have to go from one treatment to the other, to the other. It's all at the same place and the treatments are brought together in a sequenced stepped care approach. So this is the approach we, we have. So people who don't have improvement, as I mentioned, the treatment resistant depression, we, we have a staged treatment, TMS, ketamine, electroconvulsive therapy, but people are also able to exit at different time points to access newer treatments. So this is what it looks like. Um, so uh, we have, it's a digital program. So people are able to do digital monitoring. And we, we have a whole program of research around trying to understand um, treatment response using data analytics and artificial intelligence tools um, with people who are receiving these new treatments. Um, so our objective is to develop new treatments, but to also understand the brain mechanisms of the, the uh, uh, newer and emerging treatments. The two go hand in hand. One leads to improvement with the other. Um, more information is available on our web portal. Uh, I'll quickly get to our web portal uh, at the end of my presentation. So our program is distinct um, for two reasons. One is the interdisciplinarity and the other is about access. Uh, it's interdisciplinary because we work across disciplines, um, psychiatry, anesthesia. We were able to develop the ketamine program because we work with anesthesia. Um, in a similar manner, I work with neurosurgery to be able to uh, have that the deep brain stimulation program. Um, I have uh, you know, appointments within the Faculty of Engineering, and um, that enables us to do uh, quite a bit of our uh, analytics work. We are fundamentally about change, whether um, uh, you use psychotherapy or whether you use brain stimulation or whether you use uh, uh, in onesthetic agents or psychedelics or digital self-monitoring. It's really about bringing about change. Um, so I've mentioned ketamine before. Um, so ketamine has dissociative and psychotomimetic side effects. They're usually short lasting. Some of the longer term side effects include cystitis and abuse. Um, um, so um, we have developed a ketamine clinical program where we get referrals throughout the greater, greater uh, in the Toronto area. We have a public hospital-based ketamine program um, and uh, in IV ketamine has good evidence. Um, it is off-label, but it has good evidence in terms of managing depression. So this is our research program. It's clinical and research, you know, at the crossroads of anesthesia and psychiatry. We, we're looking at ketamine, nitrous oxide, laughing gas used in the dentist's office. We're looking at head-to-head -head trials. We're comparing ketamine to nitrous oxide, uh, you know, to see if people who don't improve with one may improve with the other. And then we're looking at other anesthetic agents. So this is again the three pillars of the program. I've I've covered the uh, you know, psychedelic, the anesthetic portion. Um, I just want to mention one or two things about the neurostimulation piece um, and about our take-home, our emphasis on take-home treatments. So. This is an example where we were, uh, this is a CIHR funded trial where we're trying to look at whether, uh, you know, inducing repeated smiles a day using this simple device um, in a manner like what we do with TMS, this is a take home treatment, uh, could actually keep people well. This is not in the same realm as ECT or TMS, but when people get better, could they have something at home? you know, a neuro neurostimulation modality at home to actually keep them well. 
There are more details available on our web portal. Finally, in the last minute or two, I want to give an overview of our uh, third pillar, which is the digital pillar. And we, we have a group around this, which I lead, uh, the Digital Interventions and Intelligence Group. Um, we have an app which allows for data collection. Um, so what is DIG? DIG is the acronym for the Digital Interventions and Intelligence Group. So we have data being collected through different modalities. It could be your phone, it could be wearables, um, or it could be through virtual reality, which I'll show in a moment. The, we do different studies and it's often uh, you know, interleaved with patients within our uh, program, or it could be for healthy participants. Um, it is app-based studies, it could be wearables, and uh, this collects a lot of data and we, we need uh, in artificial intelligence and analytics to actually give data-driven insights and uh, you know, a personalization based upon that person's pattern. It could be sleep, it could be activity, or it could be other details. So uh, this is an example of the app. Um, it, you know, this is just to give you an overview. This is not our app uh, in particular, but this is what it does. We we collect active data, and we're able to have surveys to assess um, and track symptoms. Um, and th this could be filled out by the patient or by the family member. And this is very helpful for self-monitoring, but also for discussion with the, the clinician. And then there's passive data, which is collected, whether the participant is using it or not. And this is partly why we use the wearables. Um, so the we collect data, as you've seen before, mood, sleep, anxiety, activity, um, and this is this is, and we use data-driven uh, in, insights to actually understand and personalize treatments. We also do quite a bit of virtual reality where we set up um, uh, you know, scenarios which people can go through to actually understand uh, their stress response. Um, um, we, we have a study which will be starting in the next couple of weeks as well, where we have simulated scenarios to actually understand people's stress response. And we're looking at people who, uh, more from the prevention side and also the rehabilitation side, a lot of the emphasis has been in terms of actual treatment in the hospital. But as I mentioned before, we, we want to focus on the prevention side, you know, understanding interventions. It could be exercise, it could be meditation, it could be things like that, which could have a preventive effect, but also a rehabilitative effect. I want to go back to the initial slide where we mentioned that depression is the leading cause of disability. And a lot of that is because of residual symptoms and people not being able to return back to their baseline. So um, I have, this is an example of our virtual reality setup, which is very immersive and people are able to go through that. Uh, I'll just take one more minute to uh, introduce you to our web portal and then I'll take questions after. So um, all the information regarding our program is on our web portal. Um, so we have one referral for all the, the treatments offered within our program. People need to have a referral from their family physician. So it is, or their regular psychiatrist. All the referral information is on the web portal. Uh, we are an interventional program. We don't take over the care of participants. But we have a focus on, you know, really new and emerging treatments and trying to understand them. Um, the three pillars of our program, as I mentioned before, uh, the details are there. And I also want to acknowledge uh, our, our team. We are uh, roughly 20, 25 people who have actually contributed to a lot of the work which I have mentioned now. Um, and also all of our funding partners, which I mentioned at the beginning. Last thing which I'll mention, I mentioned about uh, our work within AI and analytics. Uh, for people who may be interested, we're organizing um, a symposium the coming week, the 13th and the 14th. Uh, the topic is around AI. I lead the AI and analytics pillar within iBEST, which is an institute which brings together TMU with St. Michael's Hospital. And we have a number of interesting topics and, and very pertinent topics on 
in artificial intelligence and algorithms, and also on the impact of artificial intelligence and society. So I will stop here. And uh, Satish, I'm open to questions. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt. And if may I request you to just uh, turn off your presentation so we can come to the full more. Yes, excellent. Thank, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Bhatt, for such a very uh, detailed presentation and uh, giving the different modes of uh, uh, treatment options uh, available today's date and how science is advancing further technology being incorporated into, into the treatment options. That's a very, very fascinating. We have quite a few uh, questions to ask and uh, I'll, I'll begin with the first one. As you rightly uh, mentioned that our brain is, you know, electrochemical organ. So uh, do you think uh, our eating habits, certain type of food. Uh, of course, we talked about uh, psych in, in cognitive behavioral uh, therapy, that certain type of thoughts which you generate and you are mindful of your thoughts that how you can nurture more positive thought to curb the negative thought. Uh, how do you think that helps in uh, you know, preventing depression? So um, that's a good question um, and um... Psychotherapy, as I've mentioned before, uh, is um, first line in terms of managing depression. There's a lot of evidence that, you know, psychotherapy has a significant effect in terms of preventing relapses. Um, you know, it, it um, helps people deal with the current symptoms of depression. It helps people manage symptoms of depression better, but it also helps prevention of recurrence. Um, I've mentioned some of the evidence-based modalities, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy also has uh, uh, you know, significant evidence. Um, what is also important to keep in mind that a lot of these things finally come to self-management um, and people need to realize what it is which works for them. This is where the emerging technologies can be helpful in terms of giving people data-driven insights, you know, whether it's better sleep management, better stress management, uh, better you know, physical activity. Uh, um, in exercise, by the way, has very good evidence in terms of managing stress, managing symptoms, you know, improving the quality of sleep. It, it has both mind and body benefits, whether exercise is delivered through vigorous aerobic physical activity or other modalities. So I think it's important to keep that holistic aspect in mind and people need to understand what works for them. What's stressful for one person is not stressful for another person. And people need to have that self-understanding of, uh, of uh, um, what are their limits in terms of handling stress and what they could do to actually enhance their ability to handle stress. You know, it could be through mindfulness, it could be through physical activity or through uh, other other uh, uh, modalities. A key area is also about resilience. Um, how do you, and resilience is really that threshold to handle stress. You know, can we actually increase that threshold to handle stress? And um, there's quite a bit of ongoing work. It's, it's a fascinating area for, you know, people to maintain wellness, um, but also to actually uh, prevent episodes of uh, of, of uh, um, you know, depression. No, excellent. And do, do you think diet also plays a, an important role in, in that regard? Yeah, you know, healthy sleep, uh, healthy habits, diet, sleep, physical activity, you know, that is, that is the core of, uh, um, you know, being able to manage any of the symptoms, uh, whether it's depression or other, uh, you know, mental health conditions, physical health conditions. Um, so in all of them are, are uh, uh, important. Um, a number of these disorders are associated with worse outcomes. So diet is even more important. So um, metabolic complications, by that I mean, um, you know, blood sugar, lipids, this can be altered in people with uh, depression, people who are taking medication. So diet is particularly important to monitor these things. It's also important to keep in mind that, you know, a lot of these mental health conditions are disorders of the young. 
almost 75% of them have onset before age 25. Right. Uh, you know, whether it is depression, psychosis, or other things with depression, uh, you know, as well. So that's partly why it's the leading cause of disability. So you have early onset and you, you have a burden for a substantial period of time. So the, the ability, whether it is through, um, you know, increased re resilience training, healthy sleep, physical activity, and people recognizing uh, these aspects earlier on can actually have a significant impact in terms of long-term uh, um, outcomes. Oh, excellent. So a follow-up question uh, we, we got from uh, Mr. Hajik Ali Baloch, who, who's a participant today, that we were talking about the early uh, you know, anxieties in the very young age. So his question is that, um, you know, when you are growing up, in your academic years, you always get pressure to score higher, higher GPAs and grades, and uh, which which creates a lot of anxiety among you know young students to compete and uh, score higher. So, what what do you think? What's your opinion uh, uh, in that regard? That how we can stimulate or how we can build more resilience, or do you think? This is not a proper social system. We need to change that uh, scoring grade is not important as long as you are performing well otherwise in the class. Um, you know, it's, it's a timely question. Um, it's important to keep in mind that depression is a biopsychosocial and cultural disorder. Um, so, you know, when I say stress is individual, we could also say that there's a cultural element to stress of, uh, you know, what is perceived as should be the objectives or the goals. Um, and it's often important to see what the person's threshold is. So this comes back to the question of managing stress and, you know, uh, in understanding that individual person's, uh, uh, you know, threshold. Um, so, what may be stressful for one is, as I mentioned before, not stressful for the other. And things like a focus on, um, uh, you know, regular physical activity, attention to sleep, diet, um, and a balance in things can actually have an impact in terms of that stre stress, uh, uh, you know, uh, threshold. And people can work in terms of enhancing that threshold. So I think, you know, within the university population, um, there are cultural elements with respect to how people should do and what people should do. And I think it should be tailored to the person um, and people need to understand uh, and have that discussion within a social or a familial context to ensure that the person is able to manage things in a reasonable manner. Um, you know, it, and every, uh, people across walks of life have different ways of handling things and looking at things. So the, the goals may be different, but the solutions to them might, might also be different. Um, so what may be applicable within one culture may not be translatable to another culture. The solutions may also be different, but it's important to recognize the symptoms. Um, it may present in slightly different ways, but people will still have lack of interest, you know, uh, uh, low mood and all of the other symptoms, they, the, this lack of concentration, changes in appetite. So that symptom cluster of depression is universal, although, you know, it can present itself in slightly different ways based upon the cultural context. In a similar way, the treatments which I mentioned, it needs to be tailored to that setting. Not everything may work from one setting to the other, but there has to be a recognition that this is important. This can lead to worse outcomes. I mentioned about, you know, anxiety, stress, death by suicide, you know, all of these things. So they need to have interventions which could be customized and personalized. Uh, great. And <clears throat> if uh, I may sum it up uh, and correct me if, uh, if I'm uh, wrong. So depression is all about, you know, how you think, what you think, and how you keep your mind stimulated. We all say that mind is always fluctuating. It's like a monkey. It goes from one 
a thought to another thought and how you keep yourself completely stimulated. And in yoga, there is a one basic, uh, I think the fundamental or the foundation of yoga, which it says that yoga chit vritti nirodha, mean uh, that keeping the fluctuation or tendencies of the mind or calming your mind from those tendencies or those impulsive thoughts is all about yoga or all about yoga means all the mindfulness which we uh, practice or promote that is basically calming your mind and be being the witness of your thoughts which which i uh, saw that in your cognitive uh, behavioral therapy like one of the key area is that you are focusing on to identify what the negative thoughts are and how to first identify those negative thoughts and then how to uh, you know curb those or suppress those thoughts and by bringing the positive thoughts so just want to um, understand from you that one of the key thinking i i think we need to think for 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 that is that in early childhood years that that behavioral um, uh, you know science which which should become a part and parcel of the curriculum of every kid that how to stay positive how to be yourself uh, you know witness of your own negative thoughts so, so that you can create your own positive thoughts to suppress those that let them not be the dominant in in your mind so just want to uh, uh, get your perspective on that yeah so uh, you know i'll i'll mention three things uh we have to recognize, you know, I mentioned that depression is a biopsychosocial cultural manifestation, but there's a strong biological element there. So roughly 50% of depression is heritable. Um, and the other 50 is the psychosocial environmental other factors. So there's a strong biological basis, you know, which presents itself through, you know, the uh, symptom clusters, which I've mentioned, which are characteristic, although there are some changes in terms of how it presents based on the cultural context. So uh, it's important to keep that biological aspect in mind uh, because it defines the person's stress threshold, the characteristic ways of uh, uh, being able to respond to treatments as well. So that is uh, you know, one key aspect. The second thing to keep in mind is, you know, at the end of the day, when I see my patient, uh, you know, I spend an hour speaking with them, trying to understand what is it that brought them to this point. It's really about the person's life story. You're trying to understand the person's narrative. And my responsibility as a clinician is to change that narrative, uh, you know, and, and use any method you want to change the narrative. You talk with the person, use physical activity, use brain stimulation, use mindfulness. The, 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 the narrative that, you know, I'm not good. Um, I don't. I'm not able to do anything. The world is bad. The, changing that narrative and, and the whole uh, context with early childhood stresses and trauma. There's a lot of evidence that it leads to negative outcomes. That's a critical intervention point. Whether it is, you know, better recognition or, as you said, people being needing to have more self-awareness. Whether it's from the family perspective or from the individual perspective to have better stress management and to, re and to recognize the signs that people need help. Um, and to not have, you know, the stigma or the concern with actually seeking help. Help is available, but, you know, not recognizing that this is something needs help is something which can actually lead to more stress and worse, worse uh, uh, you know, outcomes. Um, so that's a key aspect. And there's so much literature that there's also transfer of intergenerational uh, um, um, stress. You know, the, the, there's elegant work showing epigenetic changes, like at at the at the genetic level, how stress actually interacts, leading to um, worse outcomes. So, some examples are where when people had death by suicide, they looked at the the brains and of the people and they were able to find that there's an interaction between people who have had early childhood trauma or stress and its negative impact on the brain. So I think that's a critical intervention period. Last thing I'll mention, as I mentioned before, at the end of the day, 
you know, uh, I'm looking at the stories and changing people's narratives. And mindfulness is a recognized way. Uh, and, um, you know, there are two ways to handle things. Either you can change the external environment when you're speaking about stress, or you can change your response to that external environment. And a lot of what you said about self-awareness, you know, is about changing your response, understanding what you're able to manage, how you're perceiving it. So it's it's that uh, um, you know understanding of your yourself, which is a long process, and also the ability to actually manage your inner self so that there is homeostasis. So there's that you know the the uh, the the uh, experience of stress is different, and it does not lead to a point where the person actually gets uh, you know, depressed. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> another question uh, came about the phobia. Many people develop different kinds of phobia. So what's, what's your take on that? So I mentioned earlier that anxiety and depression are two sides of the same coin. So, uh, you know, a large proportion of people who have depression also have anxiety. So phobia is one kind of anxiety. Um, you know, it's within that larger spectrum. Um, so the treatments which I've mentioned before, um, when they work for depression, often they also work for anxiety. So the when symptoms of depression improve, the symptoms of anxiety also improve. Um, for depending on the type of phobia, there are also specific treatments. Um, you know, it could be, it could be, uh, uh, you know, exposure therapy uh, to that specific form of phobia. It could, it could be cognitive behavioral therapy. This for phobias, there's a lot of evidence for psychotherapy. And I just want to also mention, I mentioned some of our work in the virtual reality realm. There's also evidence where, you know, these psychotherapies, particularly exposure-based psychotherapies could be offered in the virtual reality settings as well. So, you know, if you're looking at evidence-based treatments, there are a number of psychotherapy, uh, you know, treatments to deal with phobia, whether it goes with depression or not. Um, and then there are also medication options similar to what I've mentioned uh, uh, for depression. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bhart. I know how busy you are. We won't take much of your time. So thank you once again for joining and share, sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. Uh, friends, mind is your very vital, I would say, the foundation of your life and your physical health, mental health, and spiritual health. This is very, very important. Uh, mind, we all know it's a seat of your consciousness, your experience, your first-hand experience, first-person experience, what you get is through your mind. And uh, it is, you know, a seat of your all emotions, thoughts, feelings, all emerge from mind. And uh, as you nourish your body through uh, you know, right kind of a food, same way, nourish your mind every day with the right kind of a thoughts as well. So uh, I want to take this opportunity on Canada India Foundation to uh, thank each and everyone uh, for joining us uh, this morning. And at Canada India Foundation, our objective is to promote uh, wellness, good health uh, and well-being for every each and every one. And I want to specially thank uh, Dr. Venkat Bhatt, Bhatt for uh, joining us uh, uh, this morning and sharing your wisdom and thoughts and giving us perspective. Uh, anyone would like to connect with uh, Dr. Bhatt, please do write to us. And uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, our media partners, uh, Y Channel and uh, Pravasi Media uh, for supporting all our events, all our sponsors, all our members who provide requisite uh, resources to carry out our activities. And uh, uh, please stay tuned with Canada India Foundation and its activities. We've been running an Ayurvedic uh, speaker series bi-weekly. Uh, so same way to promote good health and well-being that how uh, these all uh, nat nature-based or, uh, you know, nature-based products and other uh, ancient wisdom can help us all to be stay happy, healthy, and uh, always uh, in an elevated state of mind. So thank you once again for joining and uh, have a very, very wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Satish, and thanks to the Canada India Foundation. Thank you.